everybody. Uh, this is Linda Keeley with ICF International. I'm the uh, OCAT project manager and going to kick off uh, today's county discussion forum on healing secondary stress. Uh, Wendy, if you haven't already done so, please uh, mute the phones now. Uh, we're going to start with a very brief update like we do on all of our calls, but it's going to be even briefer than usual so we can get right to the topic at hand. Um, First, uh, as of this morning, we uh, counties have appraised uh, over 63,682 clients. So that number is climbing and climbing, and um, we appreciate the effort and hard work that you guys are doing out in the field. Um, just to let you know, in the next two weeks, we are going to be deploying uh, another release, uh, release 1.51 to OCAT. This is going to address the issue of cases being erroneously linked when they share the same AUCN but are not in different counties. Um, what's going to happen once we deploy that uh, within the next couple of weeks, that only cases um, that are in the same county with the uh, same AUCN will actually link. And when a case is transferred to a new county, uh, a visual prompt will remind uh, the case managers to update the AUCN because once it's transferred, it'll no longer link to any cases in the old county or the new county until you update the AUCN. So as usual, we're going to be sending out uh, release notes that will explain that in detail, and uh, as always, you have the OCAD help desk to help you out if you need any clarification on that. However, uh, for today, um, we're going to be talking about uh, secondary stress. Um, just to let you know, we're going to do things a, a bit uh, differently today. We would like to change things up. Because of the nature of the discussion, um, we're going to uh, enable you to chat and send your questions in um, uh, privately um, to the host. Only the host will be able to see them, not the rest of the, um, the participants on the phone. And the way you do that is um, on the right-hand side of your screen, you should see a Q&A pod, and at the bottom of it, there's a rectangle. Uh, with a little um, black line around it. If you click in there, that will allow you to type in your question, and then you uh, click on the little uh, chat icon or the chat bubble uh, to send the question for the host to see it. Um, Patrick Hyman, uh, who you heard a bit earlier, who coordinates the, uh, some of you may have met him, he coordinates the, some of the technical assistance and training for OCAT, will be fielding questions to our speaker today, who is Wayne Scott. Uh, by the way, before I introduce Wayne, um, somebody asked, what is an AUCN? Great, great question. Uh, we, we are victims of acronyms. AUCN is Assistance Unit um, Case Number. <laughs> Sorry, mine. Look there, thank you. Assistant units case number. Okay, so anyhow, um, so today we have with us Wayne Scott, and uh, Wayne describes himself as a one part therapist, one part teacher, and one part storyteller. So uh, we are looking forward to hearing from all three parts today, Wayne. And uh, again, please feel free to send us uh, questions anytime, time permitting. Well, uh, Patrick will. Uh, uh, relay them to Wayne, as well as we're going to have some polls for you like we did last time, uh, which will be another way for you to interact. We hope you interact as much as possible to get the maximum value out of today's call. So take it away, Wayne. Good afternoon, and hi to everybody from Portland, Oregon, where it is gray, cold, and rainy, and I'm not happy about it. Um, but what I am happy about is the opportunity to talk about secondary stress, which we also sometimes call vicarious trauma. This is a topic that I'm super passionate about talking about. Um, I, I love talking about it with people who do human services um, and healthcare work. Um, some of the goals that I have for today, um, first of all, I'm gonna, um, I'll tell you a little bit about myself in a minute. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the key terms that you need to understand to understand secondary stress, how to talk about it, how to have a, um, a common language for discussing it with your coworkers, with your colleagues. Um, as I go through the webinar, I'm going to cite a number of resources. So if you're curious about this and you want to go deeper, you can do that even though the, we've only got about an hour together today. Um, I will be sharing some information about the neuroscience 
of toxic stress so that we increase our brain literacy, our understanding of our brains and our bodies and how they respond to toxic stress so that we get better equipped at being able to buffer some of the impacts of doing difficult work. And then I'm also going to talk about um, the importance of authentic relationship, especially with coworkers, because that is a very um, powerful antidote to uh, vicarious trauma or secondary stress. Um, you can send in questions all throughout. Um, I will be taking them mostly at the end, um, assuming I haven't already talked about them at some, in some one of the components of the training. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about myself and where I come from. I'm a family therapist by training. I have worked a lot with families who have been impacted by interpersonal violence. I've worked as a therapist, and currently I do a lot of consulting and teaching in the area of trauma-informed care and the neuroscience of, stress, of, of toxic stress. I think it's important to um, keep in mind that, you know, as human services people and social workers, there is just so much paperwork and bureaucracy that we have to navigate on behalf of our clients. And sometimes it gets easy to forget that we are, in fact, on the front lines of what it means to, to be in a compassionate and just society. Um, we make significant personal sacrifices by making the choice to do this work. And I'm going to talk more about that in a second. But let me just tell you a little story about my own experience um, with vicarious trauma. I graduated from social work school in 1989. At that time, the word vicarious trauma didn't even exist. Um, sometimes people talked about compassion, uh, compassion fatigue or burnout, but those were also conditions that applied to accountants during tax season, and it didn't really seem fair or equivalent to what those of us who were in human services were experienced, experiencing. I had this deep calling to work with families who were impacted by interpersonal violence, and over the first six years of my career, I worked a lot with um, survivors of physical and sexual violence, domestic violence, and, and perpetrators. At my heyday, five years into my career, I had a, a caseload of about 50 violent men that I worked with. I saw a lot of guys in groups. I had six groups going a week. Um, and by, by Friday, at the end of the week, um, to be quite frank with you, I was a bit of a mess. Um, I would come home from work at the end of the day, and my wife would say, how was your day, sweetheart? Um, and I would look back at her as if I was from some parallel world, um, and I would try to remember, well, how was my day? How was my week? Um, and I really couldn't remember. Um, the work had been so challenging that I had been kind of actively dissociating as I went. And it wasn't that I wasn't effective with my clients. I think I was quite helpful and effective for them. But in order to deal with the overwhelming stress of working with so many crisis-laden um, situations, I was kind of actively dissociating. Um, again, this was an era where we didn't know anything about the word vicarious trauma. So I coped as best as I could. Um, I stayed up really, really late at night. I watched endless, endless amounts of television and movies. I ate all of the wrong food kind of desperately trying to correct my body chemistry because I'd been kind of flooded with cortisol. Um, and I had a sort of, um, for lack of a better word, a sort of emotional numbness um, to the people that I love that just I kind of wasn't there in a way. It's almost like my I kind of short-circuited. In 1996, Lorianne Perlman and Karen Sackwini um, published a book that was called Trauma and the Therapist. This was the first time that people started to talk about the word vicarious trauma. They actually started talking about the fact that there was a condition, a disorder that looked like post-traumatic stress disorder that affected people who worked in human services. Even though they weren't the direct uh, recipients of trauma, the, the very fact of, of hearing the stories over and over and over again left a residual impact on them that looked a lot like PTSD. I was in a workshop when I found out about this, and it was like a light bulb went off above my head, and not a happy light bulb. Um, I was actually kind of devastated at the extent of self-inflicted 
uh, damage I had done to myself and my family relationships. And um, at, at this point, I was still in my 20s, and I did something that people in their 20s uh, can impulsively do. I, I just kind of impulsively quit my job a few weeks later, and I left the field for a number of years, and I, and I went back, well, for three years, and I went back to graduate school to get yet another graduate degree. Um, I was away from the field of social work for um, two and a half years, and something interesting happened. I started to um, miss it. I started to miss that vital sense of being able to help people. And I decided that I wanted to dive back in and I found a job working in a psychiatric hospital. Um, and the world, of course, had changed a bit at this point. This would be in the late 90s. Um, and when I went back, I went back with a really clear understanding with my supervisors that I was gonna have some boundaries. I was gonna do a better job taking care of myself. And I stayed in that job for a good six years. And it was a hard job, um, but I, but I was able to cope with it, and I was able to do the work, do the difficult work, and stay physically and emotionally healthy. So the reason I tell this, this kind of extended story is I want all of you who are listening to know that when I talk about secondary stress or vicarious trauma, it is from a place of deep optimism and faith that we can do this really important work of helping vulnerable individuals so we can stay healthy. We can stay healthy. So before I get into talking about some of the more as, a, abstract aspects of this topic, I want to go to our first. Um, I want to go to our first poll, and that is, I want to find out what your level of familiarity um, with today's topic is. The, the topic of secondary stress um, is, has been much in the in, in the world now. Um, many people have already gone to workshops, they've attended trainings and things like that. So I'm going to give you just about 30 seconds to let me know, you know, how familiar are you with this topic? Not familiar at all? Um, somewhat familiar? Are you very familiar? Have you attended several workshops and read about it? And do you think you could even explain it to a lay person if you needed to? So I'm going to give you um, just about uh, 20 or 30 seconds to see if we can get a good represent representation on this poll, and we'll see where folks are at. So we've got, it looks like we've got almost a majority of our participants now um, chiming in. And it looks to me like we have uh, a, a, about half of the room is about is somewhat familiar with the idea, um, and then other people are not so familiar. And then it looks like there may be uh, six or seven people who could co-teach the class with me. So that would be awesome. Um, I will try to gear um, the topic today then to take into account that we've got some we've got a sizable number of people who are somewhat new to this topic. Um, yeah. Um, let me give you some context though. Let's let's go let's go big picture. Let's go 30,000 feet um, uh, above the earth. I want to situate our discussion about secondary stress within the larger framework of trauma informed care. This is another word that's really big now in human services. Um, how do we create systems, agencies that are responsive to the ubiquitous trauma that clients who come into our into our care um, bring with them? There was an article uh, a couple of years ago in the New Yorker uh, called "The Poverty Clinic" about the important work that Nadine Burke Harris, she's a, a physician in California, is doing in a in a clinic down there. And this really gives you a really nice context for understanding trauma informed care. In a nutshell, what she found um, was that children who had significant health problems also had significant um, what they call adverse childhood experiences. They were children who were growing up in poverty uh, with uh, parents who were, had marital conflict or single parents. Um, they were exposed to addiction and violence in their communities, um, just a whole host of really heavy, heavy um, circumstances, and that these circumstances made it, um, made their health worse, made their health worse. Uh, Nadine Burkhouse, she has an awesome TED Talk um, that you can find. You just have to Google her name and TED, and it will come up. It's about 18 minutes long, and she will go into um, a lot more depth 
about, um, about the work that she's doing in California. But I want to talk just a little bit about the study um, that she bases her work on. It's called the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. It was conducted by Kaiser a number of years ago over a large group of people um, that were in their services. And what they found, they looked at, I think, 10 major adverse childhood experiences. And what they found is that the more adverse childhood experiences a person endorsed as being true for them, led, it was correlated with social, emotional, and cognitive impair impairment, which was also correlated with risky health behaviors, which was then correlated with increased disease, disability, and social problems, and also led to early death. This is a really, really important study linking how we feel in our minds and our spirits in our minds with how we feel in our bodies. Now, as I mentioned, this study came out a while ago, um, and many people have looked at it and, and, and updated it and revised it to res reflect other experiences. And what many folks have identified is that it's not just adverse childhood experiences that create this kind of toxic mess that some of our clients have to contend with. For many of our clients, there are underlying social conditions um, of, of oppression, historical trauma, and multigenerational oppression. The daily experience of microaggressions and implicit bias that makes people even more vulnerable um, to the health risks that we associate with adverse childhood experiences. So what does this have to do with vicarious trauma and secondary stress and the reason that you are interested in this today? Um, the trauma-informed uh, care framework promotes this idea that if we want to truly be trauma-informed, we have to be very holistic in how we think about um, how we run our agency. So it's not just how we treat our clients, it's how we treat our staff. It's how we treat um, the people who are on the front lines of providing care and compassion. Um, and any um, one of the core tenets of trauma-informed care and practice is attention to the negative, harmful impacts of vicarious trauma and really educating workers to understand um, what that looks like for them. So now I'm going to go into the second part, and I'm just going to quickly go through and talk about um, talk about some of key terms that we have to understand. The first is we want to understand trauma. What do we mean when we're saying trauma? We're talking the, t the topic today is about vicarious trauma, but what is trauma itself? Um, it's an exposure to death, threatened death, or actual or threatened serious injury or or sexual violence. I mean, it can also be a learning about something like that that happened to someone who is close to you. Fear, helplessness, and horror are parts of the subjective response that means something that it has, is traumatic for someone. So two people can go through the same catastrophic event, but maybe only one is traumatized by it because of that subjective element of how we make sense of our experiences. There are two kind of pieces to trauma, to the, to the legacy or aftermath of trauma. One are what are called the intrusive symptoms, uh, flashbacks. That's the one that's most commonly known. And then there are what are called avoidance symptoms, which are sort of like the emotional numbing, tuning out, and that kind of thing. Vicarious trauma. So this is the this is the term I mentioned that was first coined around 1996 when uh, Trauma and the Therapist, this book that I mentioned, came out, and they they defined it as and I'm going to read this for you because some of the words here are important. The cumulative and transformative impact upon the professional of working with survivors of traumatic life event, events. The pervasive effect of doing this work on the identity, worldview, psychological needs, and beliefs, and memory system of the professional. So the key words here I want to just pull out for you are cumulative and transformative. Cumulative is the residual buildup over time of hearing really sad stories about things that happen to people. And transformative is that if you're going to do this kind of work with people who are really struggling with a lot, um, you yourself are going to be changed by it. 
There's a social worker up in um, Seattle, Laura Vandermoot Lipsky, wrote a book called Trauma Stewardship. So she's taken the idea of vicarious trauma, which, which is very clinical in a lot of ways. It's kind of loaded down with a lot of psychological jargon. And she has um, has kind of updated it and revised it to make it a little bit more user-friendly. She says that trauma stewardship refers to the entirety of how we interact with others' pain, crisis, trauma, and suffering. It includes but is not limited to our intention in choosing the work we do, our philosophy of what it means to help, the tone our caregiving takes, and our daily decisions about how we live our lives. This book, by the way, um, Trauma Stewardship by Laura Vander Zalitsky, one of the best resources if you want to read more about um, vicarious trauma. And it, um, it's, a, it's a really quick, easy read, and um, it has a ton of cartoons. Um, so it's uh, also very fun. We're going to jump now to our second poll. Now, this is a confidential poll. Um, and this is an opportunity for me to hear from some of you um, some of the signs and symptoms, the ways in which vicarious trauma comes up for you. Um, this is a somewhat um, extensive, it's a fairly long poll, and so I'm going to actually give you a whole uh, minute and a half, uh, so a grand amount of time, to really go through it thoughtfully and endorse what, um, what applies to you. And I'll come back on in about uh, one minute. All right. See, some people are still um, putting in some ideas, um, and I am just taking a look at sort of noticing what people are endorsing. Wow. Just want to take a minute. Um, I know some of you are still um, completing this. But I just want to take a minute to um, appreciate the magnitude of personal sacrifice that accompanies the choice to do um, human services work, reaching out to people who have really received are on the short end of the stick in terms of um, social advantages. Um, we engage in all of these behaviors and feeling states as a way of um, self-protecting against the, the toxic stress that doing this work brings into our lives. Um, and I just want to really, and I don't know that agencies are really set up um, to, to appreciate um, and to acknowledge um, just a tremendous personal sacrifice that we make, the, the, the occupational hazard that accompanies um, doing this work. Um, and just look, I'm looking down the list and looking for some of the areas that are most strongly endorsed. 
unhealthy eating and poor sleep. We will be talking about cortisol in a couple minutes, um, but that really helps to explain a lot around eating issues and sleeping issues and bad dreams. Um, I don't think anybody who does this work um, cannot get away with not having bad dreams about work. Um, exhaustion, huge endorsement of exhaustion is something that people um, struggle with. Um, and cynicism. Um, you know, really, it's not just how it affects our brains and our bodies, but our belief and our philosophy about what it means to live in the world. Um, that um, that that's that's huge. Somebody um, is asking a question about, you know, can you just give us a definition of vicarious trauma? And I just want to kind of throw that out for you. And I'll just say off the top of my head what I think it is. I mean, obviously, all these signs and symptoms are the way that vicarious trauma surfaces in our lives in specific ways, right? But in a, in, in a, in a global sense, vicarious trauma is when we suffer something akin to post-traumatic stress disorder um, by our close um, relationship with people who face extreme adverse experiences. So clients who are constantly in the midst of um, crisis and catastrophe you know, who are in a state of emergency, and they bring that to us, and we're interacting with them around that, and it has an effect on us. That is vicarious trauma. Wait for my slide to come up again. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for, for sharing about that. Um, I'm going to go now into talking a little bit. So, so we've seen all these signs and symptoms. But why do we have um, why do we have these signs and symptoms? Why do why do they come up this way? What's the underlying meaning? So we want to talk a little bit about um, the neuroscience of toxic stress. One of the reasons we want to talk about this is we want to increase our literacy about how our brains work, how what the structure of the brain is, and how it connects to um, our um, autonomic nervous system and the whole flow of hormones through our bodies. You know, I want to, um, so I'm a storyteller, I'm a therapist, and I'm a teacher. I am not a neuroscientist, so I want to be really, really clear on that one. Um, but I am really passionately interested in neuroscience and its ability to uh, provide us with ideas about how we can take better care of ourselves. Um, and so when, when I try to talk about neuroscience with folks, I'm often reducing what is a quite com the quite complex phenomena of our brains and bodies to very um, simple, sometimes crude metaphors um, about how the brain works. So the first one may be one that may be familiar to some of you. It comes from the work of Dan Siegel. It's called The Brain in Your Hand. So as I'm talking to you, I'm going to ask you to hold up your hand uh, like you see on the slide, and we're going to give I'm going to give you a really – uh, basic understanding of how the brain works. So hold your hand up uh, in front of you and fold your thumb over your palm. Now, your, so your wrist is representing your brain stem, the connection of, from, your, from your brain to your body, to the rest of your body. Your thumb, which you've just folded over your palm, represents your limbic system. The limbic system is the oldest part of our brain. It is, um, it is the oldest part. It is, it's part of our evolutionary heritage. It's what enabled us to survive when we were cave people. It's what we have in common with all other mammals. Um, sometimes the limbic system is referred to as the threat center. It's the part of us that is alert to threats and rewards, but mostly alert to threats, things that could uh, threaten our survival. Now, I want you to go back to your hand, and I want you to fold your four fingers over your thumb, okay? We're approximating what the brain looks like. So that part that folds over the thumb, that represents your prefrontal cortex. Now, this is the thing that makes us interesting as humans. This is the part of our brain where language comes from um, that, that enables us to think, to be analytical, to be thoughtful, um, to, to interpret the threats that come into us through our limbic system and to make conscious, intentional decisions about what we do with them. 
Now, two things I want to just point to, a couple basic truths I want to put point out to you about the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex. So the limbic system is always on. It is always active and ready to strike. In fact, when we're fatigued or when our clients are fatigued, it becomes even more powerful. That's the part of us that gets triggered by stress. And for trauma survivors, it's the part of us that sometimes has um, an exaggerated response to stress. Um, for trauma survivors, many times, that connection between the prefrontal cortex and the, the limbic system um, is fragile. Um, it's not a, an integrated system. And in fact, they, their, their limbic system is often quite, quite hot. It's very activated, and they're very easily, um, they're very easily activated. Sometimes we call that triggered. Um, we also, as people, as professionals, we also have this limbic, limbic system and this prefrontal cortex. When we are under unrelenting toxic stress, um, we are at risk to, how they say, blow our lids, and that's when the fingers fly off of the thumb, and we are operating on pure limbic energy, fight, flight, or freeze, right? So really extreme responses to environmental stressors. Um, because, again, the prefrontal cortex, it fatigues very, very easily, um, and it's especially taxed more when it has to make um, decisions. Uh, another book that I would um, recommend to you, um, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, um, it's about 900 pages long, so I thought it was a good read, but uh, you have to have a lot of patience to get through uh, something like that. Um, but actually, the, the very title itself um, provides a way for us to deepen our understanding of the relationship between the limbic sense, the, the, the limbic part of our brains and the prefrontal cortex. Um, human beings get ulcers. We all know that. We all get inflamed guts because of stress, right? Zebras do not. But it's not that zebras don't have stressful lives. In fact, zebras have extremely stressful lives. They are chased by lions and other predators. They have to contend with drought and starvation. The thing that separates the zebras from the human beings, though, is that the zebras don't have the prefrontal cortex. Zebras are pure uh, limbic energy. If a zebra is chased by a predator, um, their their limbic system turns on, um, sends a message to their body to activate the, the flow of cortisol, which enables them to respond as if in an emergency to survive. And so they either fight, fly away, or they freeze. Right? That's what that's what cortisol does. That's what the limbic system is able to activate. Um, two things happen when a le when a zebra is being chased by a lion. Uh, one is the lead zebra gets away. Because of the size of their brain then, they forget about it. They go on with life. They don't have a prefrontal cortex that would enable them to worry endlessly about the next time a lion comes after them. Um, or the other likelihood that happens when a zebra is chased by a predator is that um, they get eaten and then they're dead and so they're not going to be very stressed. So cortisol is like one of the major hormones. I mean, there's a number of hormones that are activated when our limbic system is, is activated. Um, cortisol is is huge. It's, it's generally it's somewhat well known amongst people who work in the human services. Um, this is a this is a, a hormone that allows us to respond and survive in an emergency situation. It allows us to mobilize physically if we have to physically um, get away. Um, it, um, so it's a very helpful thing to have if you're in an emergency situation where you have to run for your life. So you want to have cortisol. The problem is if you're in human services where you're surrounded by people who um, are constantly in a state of crisis and emergency, your limbic system gets triggered all the time, and the flow of cortisol is unrelenting. It's unrelenting because, again, it's sort of like their crises and emergencies can become our crises and emergencies. Um, and so when I talked earlier about my my struggle after my long work weeks with eating everything, all the wrong foods, having a hard time sleeping, um, having bad dreams and all that, that's very cor strongly correlated with having so much cort cortisol circulating in your system. Cortisol um, turns off our appetite, 
right? It reduces our sense of our own hunger. That's why so many of us, when we're working, we don't eat a lot, right? Because we're just we're just too kind of anxious to to want to eat, or we eat too much because we're trying to correct our body chemistry, you know, the flow of that that cortisol. Um, it's also why um, very sugary foods and carbohydrates are attractive to us um, when we're in crisis. So we've talked a little bit about the structure of the brain. The other, um, the other piece that I want to just introduce a little bit of information about is what's called the autonomic nervous system. That is the part, that is the aspect of who we are that is activated by the limbic system when we feel threatened um, and that gets those, those hormones going. Um, there are two parts to the autonomic nervous system. There's the sympathetic and there's the parasympathetic. The sympathetic is that part of us that's able to get activated, um, that can that, that gets our agitation up, that you know that allows us to exert ourselves and survive. Um, the parasympathetic is what it's like the brakes. Um, it's what allows us to kind of slow down, calm ourselves, um, and get back to a state of quiet stillness. Um, so one way people, one crude metaphor that people use to understand the, the autonomic nervous system is that it's kind of like um, the accelerator and the brakes in a car. The sympathetic is like the accelerator, it's the thing that gets us moving really fast, um, and the parasympathetic is like the brakes, it slows us down. So if you work in human services, you work in an environment where someone's pressing on your accelerator all day long. I'm a yoga enthusiast, I love yoga, and yoga has actually really helped me to um, understand this connection between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. Um, yoga, in most yoga classes I've been in, there's an alteration, a shifting back and forth between physical poses where you have to really strain and physically exert yourself. It takes a lot of energy and strength to get into them. And then these um, poses that are about just utter stillness and quiet. And that going back and forth helps us to distinguish between the sympathetic and uh, parasympathetic. So it's another, kind of, for me, it's another metaphor that helps to understand it. One of the resources I want to share with you, if you want to learn stress impacts our bodies and our brains, a uh, great TED Talk that Kelly McGonigal did um, called How to Make Stress Your Friend. And she talks about both cortisol. She also talks about oxytocin. Um, and it's a much longer, um, much longer than what I'm going to be able to go into today. The last piece that I want to talk talk about when it comes to understanding our brains um, is that um, is that our brains are social. Um, one of the things that has enabled human beings as a species to survive and to thrive is that we are tribal. We have a collective social intelligence that's actually built into how our bodies operate. So when I was talking about um, the flow of hormones that gets activated when we're in crisis or when we're under stress, one of those hormones is called oxytocin. Many people are familiar with this. Nursing mothers are certainly familiar with it. It is the hormone that allows um, for breastfeeding. Um, sometimes it's called the cuddle hormone. It's also the chemical that leads us to want to ask for help, to connect with other people. Um, so it's important that way. And that's a huge part of the ability to sort of do this work and to be able to thrive. A very inspiring um, uh, essay, online essay on authentic connection is Brene Brown's The Power of Empathy. And if you just put that into YouTube, um, this short cartoon comes up that talks a little bit about the role and value of empathy in creating authentic connection. Brene Brown also has a famous, famous talk called The Power of Vulnerability. So that's a longer TED talk that I'd also recommend to you. Goes into more detail on understanding how we need to uh, take risks in relationship to be to be real with people. 
one of the hazards of doing the work um, is that uh, as when it comes to having authentic relationships is that we are in workplaces that tell us, that communicate a message that we have to um, act professional all the time, that we have to separate the personal and the professional. Um, and this is easier said than done. And for many people who do human services work, when you're so deeply personally impacted by your work, um, it, it creates a stranglehold where you don't know where you can talk about um, how you are impacted and what's going on for you. Um, one of the things that I would propose for folks is that um, connection, having real connections with the people that we work with, with our supervisors, with our teams, is one of the most potent antidotes to vicarious trauma. Having the language to talk about it is, is huge. Um, before I go into questions, I want to talk about self-care because that's another really important part of the phenomena of vicarious trauma and how do we address it. So you'll remember I, I used earlier, I used the, the metaphor of the car with the accelerator and the brakes. So here's a much more detailed picture of, of how we might think about the autonomic nervous system. Um, and again, um, the sympathetic part of our nervous system, that's the place where we are in a heightened state of arousal. That's the part that gets triggered in an unrelenting way when we do human services work. When you're in just this constant, fast pace of trying to respond to demands that never seem to stop. What we need to learn to do as human beings and as professionals is to activate the parasympathetic that part of us that can slow things down, that can break, that can bring us to quiet or to stillness. Um, and self-care is one of the ways that we're able to do that. If you're going to stay in this work over the long term, you have to become exceptional at, um, at self-care. We're going to do our last um, confidential poll. Um, and for this one, I'm going to give you um, – about uh, two minutes um, to to it's it's a longer poll. Um, I'll give you two minutes to endorse as many of these self care activities as apply to you, and then we'll see how we do as a group in terms of our self care. All right, so I'm going to take a look and see how people are situating themselves. It's very um, 
touching some of the things that come up, you know, people who are willing to allow themselves to cry. Um, I think that's really important. Again, sort of coming back to that idea that we have to allow the work to transform us. Um, having rich um, networks of family and neighbors and communities that we love, I see that that's one that's really popular. Um, spending time with children um, is huge. I think I might have forgotten to put pets down here, but wow, what a huge oversight that is. Um, this is really impressive that people are able to do this kind of um, self-care. This is really this is really important. And I'm glad some people. Have, I mean, it looks like people have figured out that you also can scroll down the the. The ways of taking care of yourself are um, are pretty darn endless, um, and I think that you know, in, you know, we're not in a culture that um, promotes self care um, hugely, um, and in fact, most people who do human services um, are not wealthy people. You know, that's one of the sacrifices of the work is that we don't make tons of money. Um, so, um, and yet, and yet, if we're going to do this work over the long term. Um, we have to look for ways of of becoming extremely adept at self care. Um, let me go back to my slide. Um, Patrick, were there any um, questions that have come in that you want to pose for me before we wrap up the webinar? You know, and there's been a, there's been a few questions that have come in, but um, you proceed with your contact to answer them, and then I went back to folks, and they, they confirmed that their uh, questions were answered. But we can certainly open up um, the Q&A box again for folks to enter any questions they might have. I see the question, what is cortisol? Is that one that you want me to respond to again, or do you think that, that, that I've responded to that one adequately? I think you got that one. Okay. We have had uh, a number of questions about whether or not the presentation will be available later. Um, yes, it will, both an audio recording and the slides. Right. I will also, um, I'm in the midst of working on a resource list. Um, so just a, a, a short document that includes both readings and videos that are accessible online that if people want to, you know, I've mentioned some of them here as I've gone through the webinar, but, you know, I've got twice as many that I will make available to folks if you want to continue the conversation with your, with your, your supervisors and your coworkers and your agencies. Okay, and there's a couple questions around self-care. I think number one is more practical, whether or not folks can get a copy of the self-care list. Um, and the other are around uh, specific techniques folks can use at the work site to reduce secondary trauma. Yes. So let me, let me give you two. Let me respond to that. Those are two questions. So the first one, the self-care checklist, is adapted from a checklist that is in a book called Transforming the Pain. It's called Transforming the Pain, and it's by Karen Sackwitney, S-A-A-K-V-I-T-N-E. Um, she is one of the psychologists who authored Trauma and Therapist, and it's actually much more extensive than what you guys saw in the poll, um, but it allows you to really think about the full menu of ways in which you can kind of um, – Take care of yourself. Um, so in terms of in the workplace, what do you do? What do you do? I think one of the misconceptions about self-care is that it has to take a long time. And it doesn't necessarily. Remember, we're thinking about a car that has an accelerator and a brake. And you only have to slow down a little bit sometimes to be able to activate the parasympathetic. So, for example, some... Um, things that I've become fond of recently. Um, if you go to the website mindful.org, um, it's connected with the uh, magazine Mindful. 
Um, they have a number of meditations um, that are their audio recorded meditations where someone literally guides you through a quick meditation. They are as short as one minute. So you can do a one minute um, meditation where you allow yourself to be still, to be calm, where someone kind of talks you through how to sort of gradually relax your body. They've shown that one minute of mindful meditation can make a huge difference. Um, the other thing um, that I would promote to folks is that a lot of the work we do can be done while we are physically moving in space. One of the um, misconceptions about work, I think, is that we have to always be sitting when we do it. Our meetings have to be sitting. When we're doing work at our desk, we have to be sitting. Um, but in fact, one of the ways that you can um, trigger uh, dopamine and serotonin which are other chemicals in our brain that can have a corrective response to some of the more toxic stuff is by moving around, um, standing up, um, and, and, you know, moving around through space. So I've become a real um, fan uh, of walking meetings. When I'm meeting with my staff, um, we go through, we go for a half hour walk together while we um, talk about cases and things like that. That's you're, you're accomplishing two birds with one stone. You've got the professional connection you need to do the quality assurance around cases, but you're also walking. And Wayne, kind of connected to that last question, um, another question is, what can employers do to assist employees with secondary stress? So it's a different level of support. I think that one of the most powerful things that employers can do is to support, allow, promote the conversation about secondary stress, to, to recognize and acknowledge that it even exists, um, and to create forums, whether it's in their staff meetings or their retreats, where people can really talk about the impact that the work has on them. Um, it's one of the things I said earlier on is, you know, having authentic connection is one of the most powerful antidotes to this occupational hazard, just being able to talk about it often allows people to move the stress to a different place. Um, so I think being able to, you know, creating, you know, looking for ways, employers, employees can look for ways to um, put the brakes on occasionally. You know, um, we have um, been experimenting where I work with having staff meetings start with five minutes of meditation where people collectively are led through an activity that allows them to kind of get centered in their body. So that's just a couple different suggestions. Wayne, a couple of very straightforward questions. Can you repeat the name of the resource and the spelling of the author's name for that self-care list? And then, oh, let's let you do that first. Yeah, it's, um, let me actually, I'm going to put it into the question and answers, but I think that would be easier. So it's Karen Saxony and Lori and Earlman. And the book is called Transforming the Pain. It's an older book, but um but the checklist is actually still very I still use the checklist. It's it's very valuable. And on the OCAT side, we'll look into posting that checklist on the Learning Center as well. Yeah. And then, and then Wayne, uh, um, <clears throat> oh, great, great, you added the Q&A box. Uh, was that, was that mindful.org website you recommended? Right. I believe it was. Or, well, yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, another question, Wayne. I guess we still have time. Um, what can you do when you feel powerless at work or you feel like your working environment has um, a negative impact on your health, maybe both mental and physical? Yeah. Okay, so those are two big questions. Um, let me look at powerless, the, the one on powerlessness first. Um, this is really tricky. Um, I think it's important to get um, supportive supervision in working with the cases that we work with. And I also think it's important to have teams review the work we do with clients so that one person doesn't feel like it's all just on their shoulders. Our clients come to us 
often experiencing an entrenched set of powerlessness. They bring that into the offices, office with them, and then we, being humans, we absorb it. Um, one way we reduce it is by trying to share with our colleagues and our supervisors what we're struggling with. Um, sometimes I think we have to adjust our expectations for what our clients achieve. Many of our clients are struggling with chronic adverse circumstances that are never going to resolve fully. They might just get a little bit better. You know, so I, sometimes, I think sometimes looking at what our expectations are with our clients Many uh, caseworkers, social workers, human services people are um, middle class people, you know, with middle class ideas about what a happy, pleasant life looks like. And the sad reality is that many of the clients we work with, um, that is a difficult thing to aspire to. And if we put that template on them as an expectation, it's going to be a recipe for frustration for all of us. Um, so we have to sort of like modify our expectations, you know, collaboratively with the client. What is achievable for this particular client? Um, then in terms of the environment, the negative impact on your health, I'm assuming that means other professionals in the environment. And, that, you know, that's a, that's a tricky, tricky thing because um, in human services, we are surrounded by people who are all struggling to different degrees and with different levels of success with vicarious trauma. And so we're at risk to sort of lash out and, for lack of a better word, to be mean to each other. Um, I think one of the most powerful things supervisors and managers can do is to call attention to it, call attention to, you know, to sort of name it for what it is um, and to look at what we need to do to take care of teams um, so that people aren't operate, so that their gas tanks aren't, they're not operating on the empty gas tank. That is a very short answer to a very complicated question. <laughs> um, additional question, Wayne. How does one prepare, um, or I guess, do you have any recommendations, suggestions for reading materials? Um, as folks are preparing to do an interview or an appointment or, you know, an intake session, to not get too emotional when hearing clients' stories. So, knowing that you're likely going to get, um, you know, a somewhat trauma-filled story, how do you prepare for that interaction? Right, right. Um, well, number one, so the whole question is, you know, you don't want to get too emotional, quote-unquote. Um, it's almost impossible not to get a little bit emotional. I mean, that's kind of how our brains operate, is that when someone experiences an intense emotion, we feel some piece of it. We didn't really talk about mirror neurons in this webinar, but that's a huge piece of that. We feel what other people feel. It's how we're kind of set up. Now, one way to um, to not have that become too taxing on us, though, I think, I again, I come back to this idea of having a couple moments of, you know, mindful meditation where you get centered on yourself and your own physical um, bodily reactions to someone you know, doing active things to calm yourself down physically as you're when someone is talking to you about um, a difficult situation. Breathing is hugely important. Taking long, deep, slow breaths. Um, there's a tendency, I think, when someone's talking about upsetting um, story, that we breathe in we we breathe in a very shallow way, which then tells our body that we're on the verge of panic. So we have to come back to our breathing all the time and remind ourselves to take slow deep, mindful breaths. Okay, last, last question, Wayne. Um, does the impact of vicarious trauma increase when we are going through um, our own individual difficult circumstances at the same time? So I guess two different sources of, of trauma. Yeah, it, it, absolutely do, it absolutely does. And one of the um, beautiful things about the trauma-informed care framework is that it acknowledges that as human beings we also struggle with um, we also struggle with some of the same stuff that our clients do and in fact we also many of us have our own adverse childhood experiences that we uh, have to contend with um, and so you know I'm a, I'm not sure how this will fly politically um, in the system I'm talking to but I mean I'm a huge proponent of people taking mental health days um, you know I just in the same way that we our, our bodies get sick 
sometimes our, our brains get sick and we need to rest them. We need to have a break from all of the activating things that happen when we are, um, we are at work. Um, but definitely when we're going through a hard time, um, it's going to, it'll be worse. Thanks, Wayne. That was the last question. Excellent. I see somebody, uh, somebody advanced the slide and, um, that's my, if you want to learn more about me, that's my website and that's got some more resources. Um, I, there is an article actually on the front page of the website called, that I wrote a couple of years ago called The Home Life of the Trauma Therapist. Um, and so that's available on the website if you want to read it. It talks about symptoms. There's an interview with Laurie Ann Perlman and Karen Sack with me about, uh, trauma and therapist. And this is a, um, this is a clip I did on YouTube. Um, called Strong at the Broken Places. It's everything I said in this last uh, hour, but in five crisp minutes. Um, one of the most stressful experiences I've ever had in my life. <laughs> so. Well, I want to thank Wayne profusely for all of the uh, enriching information and, and resources you provide us. Um, do know if you have uh, questions and like to hear more about this topic, feel free to write the OCAD help desk. Uh, let us know if this type of um, webinar was of value to you and what other topics that um, you may be interested in learning more about in the future. So thanks again, Wayne, for everything, and thank everybody for your time this afternoon. Thank, thank you, you very much. <laughs> All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye.